Well, today I've invited in uh, Meja and Lauren to talk about uh, Hong Gildong. And Hong Gildong fits into the series that I started with the LA Cultural Center. Hello everyone, this is Mark Peterson with the Frog Out the Side the Well Research Center. And as you can see, I've got a couple of guests today. Um, they're students, they're not my students, really, well, I, well, sort of they are, but they are uh, students at Yummies. And you've met me, Ja, and Lauren before at uh, the Yummies video I did about learning Korean at a Korean restaurant. That just, that still just blows me away. That's just incredible that Korean culture uh, can have that kind of uh, appeal. So let me introduce the two of them. There's me, Ja, who is an adopted Korean, totally American, but has uh, uh, lived in, in America her whole life and is interested in learning about Korea for maybe going back to Korea and learn about her own native culture. Is that right, Mija? That's correct. Um, as I, I found that as I learn more about Korean culture and the history, I do feel more connected to my heritage. And so that's a big draw for me in learning more. That's wonderful. Welcome, Mija. And here's Lauren. Lauren is a K-pop fan. <laughs> she <laughs> likes the uh, BTS. Uh, is that why you're studying Korean, Lauren? That's definitely uh, what drew me in, for sure. Uh, but I also just like learning about other people, other countries. Uh, and I'm a bit of a history nerd, too. So this is kind of a, a fun little side. <laughs> well, that's great. Well, today I've invited in uh, me, John, and Lauren to talk about uh, Hong Gildong. And Hong Gildong fits into the series that I started with the LA Cultural Center uh, with uh, Hung Bu, the brother story, and Shim Chung, the faithful wife, and uh, uh, Shim Chung, the faithful daughter. Uh, let me show you this. Uh, these five items you see here are the Confucian uh, values. They talk about the three bonds and the five relationships. The three bonds are these first three, and the five relationships add two more. And these relationships are king to subject, father to son, husband to wife, older brother, younger brother, and friend. Now, all of these extend into other areas, like king to subject really means the people and the government. And father to son can include mother and daughter. And this was the Shim Chung story, this faithful daughter who sacrifices herself to get enough rice to buy a medicine for her father to get his sight back. Husband to wife is the Chunhyang story. Older brother, younger brother, good brother, bad brother is the, the Hongbu story. Well, today, Hong Gildong is about king the subject. And we're talking about a loyal subject who's not completely loyal. There are some problems in this story. So let's talk about that. We talk about these stories, these uh, pre-modern Korean stories as being morality tales, because they teach, you know, good virtues based on Confucianism. Uh, let's talk about Hong Gildong. Now, uh, it starts out with his birth. And there are a lot of stories like this of heroes, and they all start with the same way, <laughs> the way he's born. And he's usually born to a, a prominent uh, high official, because that's, that's the good thing. And his, sure enough, Hong Gildong's father was a high official. Uh, and Hong Gildong's father had a dragon dream. Oh. A dragon. Yeah. Can you tell me about that? I was definitely wondering what that meant. <laughs> <laughs> that That's a uh, conception dream. That means he's going to have a, a, a good son. And so that's the way he interpreted the dream. You can have dragon dreams for lots of different reasons, but he interpreted it to mean that uh, he would have a son. Uh, and it turns out he already had one son, but he, he, he knows he's going to have a wonderful son. He had a dragon dream. So what does he do? He goes in and sees his wife and says, honey, I had a dragon dream. <laughs> and she says, not tonight. <laughs> uh, go to your room. Quit acting like a silly little boy, is what she says. Something like that, right? As you read mm -hmm. her story. Uh, so he goes to his room and uh, is feeling sorry for himself. You know, got turned down, you know. And so he's in his room, and who should come by but the young maid servant with tea, you know, on probably on a regular uh, routine. 
And she comes by and she offers the tea. And what does he do? He reaches up and takes the tea and then takes her by her jade hand. <laughs> Beautiful women all always have jade hands. <laughs> <laughs> and so he takes her by the jade hand. And then um, clip, clip, clip. We jump ahead in, this, in the movie. Uh, but it's clear that he has had uh, romance with this woman. And it says that from that moment on, she knew no other man. She had known no other man, but she is faithful. So there's always this image of, of faithfulness. And she bore a son. And don't you know, the son is described as a jade son. <laughs> he was a <laughs> handsome young boy. And uh, just the ideal for everything. Yeah, Lauren? Um, so we're like... <laughs> this is relevant concubines pretty like no, uh, regular parts of these stories and does yeah. that like is that like an acceptable thing is that like oh because it says he's known for his filial piety or is this like no we don't like him now because he's got all his concubines yeah that's the problem that's the problem <laughs> sort of concubines are okay hmm. you know in this society for a high official to have concubines in fact in the humbu story when Humbu slides open the, slices open the gourds, what comes out of the first gourd? Servants and concubines. It's like a <laughs> so, gift to him. You've been yeah. good. So you've been, you've been a good boy, you get lots of concubines. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's, it's a strange thing because on the one hand, it, it's not frowned upon. I mean, it's common. But on the other hand, it really is frowned upon because the whole story of Hung Dong is that he was not born of the proper wife. He was born of a serving girl. And although she's a virtuous serving girl and all of this jade-like hands and all of this, she was still a serving girl. So he cannot aspire to the highest level of society and passing the civil service exam. And uh, uh, you see that, remember the scene of him deciding that he'll never make it in proper society and he's going to cast it all away. Remember that scene? He pushes his desk away. And I love the Koreanness of that because he's sitting on the floor. Uh, you know, an American or Westerner would push himself away from the desk. <laughs> but in Korea, he pushes his desk away and says, what did he say? Yeah, he says, when one born to a man's role cannot model himself after Confucius and Mencius, then he had best learned the martial arts. Yeah, yeah. He's this, that's, that's a pivotal a point in the story where he decides he can't be a normal you know aristocratic boy so he's going to learn the martial arts and that's where he turns to uh, eventually uh being a robin hood uh, in rob this hong kong is the robin hood story a fellow who uh, robs from the rich and ridicules the uh you know, sheriff of Nottingham Forest, you know, he's, he's ridiculing, the, ridiculing the powers that be and is, is setting off to uh, uh, help the poor. And there are lots of episodes. Everybody loves episodes of the Hong Gildong story. My favorite episode is where he's captured or cornered by the, the gendarme, by the officials, the police, in a box canyon. And uh, it's harvest season and they're uh, straw stacks, uh, stacks of straw around. And he uh, collects 10 of them and lines them up and breathes on them. And they all turn into exact replicas of him. And then there's a <laughs> big sword fight with the gendarme and the, everybody's sword fighting. And uh, the police slash one of the Hong Gildong. And when they do, it turns back into straw. And the police go through and eventually they slash each one of the phony Hong Gildong and they all fall to the ground in straw, and there's no Hong Gildong. And then up on the top of the ridge line where he had been boxed in, he says, ha, 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 you can't catch me. I'm going to live another day. And he goes on to, to, to live again. So he had all the magic of, uh, they sometimes call it Taoist magic or Chinese magic or Korean magic. He could fly. Uh, uh, flying, they say, you could go 10,000 steps in one step. Ooh. And he had, uh, he's a good swordsman and all this sort of stuff. So he's, he's out uh, doing all the good things and criticizing the bad people in government. How does it end? Is there a happy story, happy ending to this story? 
I, I guess if it means leaving your homeland and country <laughs> to start over again. Yeah, he goes off to an island and creates an ideal country, which is, again, a real condemnation of Korean society or Korean uh, uh, government uh, saying, hey, you guys have no hope. There's no way you can do it right. The only way to do it is to escape to a new place and start all over again. So all of this is social commentary, right? It's all criticism of the government. And yet he's loyal to the ideals of Confucianism. He's loyal to his, to his father. He's respectful to his father, right? Uh, but he can't be a true member of society because he's a soja. Soja is the son of the concubine. So that's our story. What did you guys get out of it? I think for me, the his loyalty to his father was a big thing and the level of respect that he had for his father, even though he couldn't ever call him father, he couldn't be claimed as, as a son. Um, even when he found out who was trying to kill him, he he chose not to kill this. Um, is it Cho? What's her name? Cho? The, the other the woman who helped conspire to kill yeah um, and yeah. and he didn't want to kill her because he knew the love of his father that he had for this woman and he didn't want to break his father's heart and so i thought that was very endearing yeah it it encourages loyalty and respect for father at the same time he says he couldn't call his father father that's probably an exaggeration uh soja Soja were of all sorts of varieties. Some of them uh, passed for aristocrats and slipped along with their fathers. Uh, there was two periods of time in the 500 year Cholson dynasty. There are two periods of about 50 years each where the government allowed Soja to take and pass exams. And so uh, they were always discriminated against, but to go as so far as they couldn't call their father, father, couldn't call their brother, brother, that's the... Uh, idiomatic cliche that shows how bad a situation they were in. It probably wasn't that bad, but there were soja who basically end up uh, as servants with their mothers and uh, end up losing all sorts of Yangban status. So they end up, they can be semi Yangban, they can be sort of commoners and they can end up uh, virtually like slaves as well. Yeah, what else did you get out of the story? Why was it at pause? the end, it was okay for him to have two wives but he came from a situation where, because he was the son of a concubine, he had illegitimacy and couldn't achieve the things that an, a legitimate child would be able to. Yeah, it's interesting that though he was the son of a concubine, and that was the problem for him, uh, concubinage and having a secondary wife uh, Koreans could never have a second wife unless the first wife died. There's a very technical terminology here. If uh, a man had a concubine, that was not a wife. That was a secondary wife. If he had a second wife, it was only if the first wife died. And, and you'll see that in the genealogies from time to time that, uh, you know, uh, the old days, mortality was hard on women. A lot of women died in childbirth. And you see a lot of cases in the Chokpo in the genealogies where a man had a second wife. But in the Chokpo, you never see the concubine. No, she's never there. But in some of the Chokpo, especially the older ones, you'll see the soja. And he's listed as a soja in, in the old documents. And he had that meant he had limitations on his, on his uh, social uh, uh, prerogatives. Uh, for example, uh, for holding the, the ancestor ceremonies, when you have the big ancestor ceremonies for the whole lineage and a lot of people would come, they have, they do the ceremonies in age order. You'd have the oldest, uh, great, 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 great grandson, the next oldest and go down in order. And then when you got to the youngest legitimate son, then you had the oldest soja. And so here's the oldest soja who's 80 years old. And he only gets to do his bows and his offering after the 20-year-old legitimate mm -hmm. son does his thing. So the whole idea of soja was just, just loaded with all sorts of social discrimination and such. Mm -hmm. yeah. What else did uh, you get out of it? I have a question. I thought it was kind of interesting. I don't know, maybe just from my own perspective. But if I read it right, the shaman and the physiognomist... Yeah, physiognomist. Uh, physiognomist. Don't know how to say that word. Um, they were both women. Did women uh, 
play the kind of a spiritual role more in these like Korean stories? Absolutely. Because like in Western stories, like a priest or whatever, they're always going to be men. Those are the leaders of the, yeah. the well, that's that's really a good question, Lauren. You saw a really interesting thing. Uh, the men would partic participate in the Confucian ceremonies, and they ne had no need to do extraneous things. The women were excluded from Confucian ceremonies, so they do other spiritual things, and that includes the women who do shamanism. And yeah. shamanism was almost always women. There are a few shamanistic men, but shamanism is ninety percent women, and that's because it's the other side of the Confucian ritual that was only for the men. And physiognomy, <laughs> that's that's face reading. And, yeah. uh, you know, in Western society, you do hand reading, uh, mm -hmm. your palm reading. But in, in uh, traditional Korean society, you, you do face reading. If you've seen the video I did on the painting in my, in my living room, one of the uh, pictures, one of the scenes there is a, a physiognomy. I mean, it's so important that in this market scene, there's a little scene of physiognomy of, of doing face reading, which is fortune telling. And uh, yeah, uh, the fortune tellers too, uh, sometimes were women, sometimes were men, but yeah, the uh, women were excluded from the Confucian stuff and they end up doing some of this non-Confucian stuff, which is shamanism and fortune telling and such. Gotcha. Was the face reading pretty common for the upper class back then? Was that something that a lot of them did? Uh, no, but they would do it. Uh, they would officially say, oh, that's that's mishin. Uh, you guys are learning Korean language. You don't know the word mishin. Mishin means superstition. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, officially, a well-educated Confucian scholar would say, oh, that's mishin. I don't do that. But then if things turn bad in his life, he doesn't know what's going wrong. His life, he'll go see the, the fortune teller. Hey, what's going on? What do I need to do? Uh, one part of, of fortune telling that's really interesting in Korea is changing your name. Uh, you go see a fortune teller and he'd say, oh, no wonder you've had bad, bad fortune. The five elements of your name are in conflict. You've got a fire name and a wood name. And it's conflicting against it. So let's change your name. Let me think of a good one. Here's a good name for you. And now you'll be better off. And so changing names was a part of uh, superstition, Mishin, that uh, uh, Yangban men would participate in. Yeah. So is Confu I, I kind of asked this earlier. I don't really know a lot about Confucianism. Is that more of a, mm, we talked about maybe being hierarchical, uh, more of a, what are the words? <laughs> upper class. Uh, like yeah. a, sorry? Uh, upper class, class. Yeah, but even just like, like mentally, like, okay, these are the things that we, more about knowing and less about feeling. I, I don't know why I can't come up with the words for this, but like shamanism might be more of that kind of inner feeling. That's right. Confucianism is textual. You read it, you study it. It's very orthodox, and it's it's confined by the the classics, whereas um, uh, fortune telling and these other sort, sorts of things are not. So yes, Confucianism has sort of restrictions on it. It's a hierarchical this way, and it's hemmed in uh, horizontally. You might say that you mm. can't. Uh, they're concerned about heterodox, heterodox meaning non-orthodox things. Uh, there's a word, idan. Idan is used uh, in Christian contexts a lot of times. Some, some churches will criticize other churches being Edan. Edan is a word out of Confucianism, meaning you're not part of the Orthodox tradition. So yes, Confucianism is, it puts you in a box mm. for sure. And uh, whereas uh, the shamanism and some of these other traditions were more open and more free, more spiritual, um, less restrictive. I was going to say earlier, you'd mentioned how sometimes, you know, if, if things are going well, but something misfortune happens and all of a sudden they'll go to like the shamanism or something. And, and I thought of, um, Hung Gil Dong's father, how he believed what was said about the face reading and his, his future. And so I yeah. thought that was, that's interesting then that somebody, this educated, man uh, yeah officially a confucian uh, scholar uh, wouldn't pay attention to that but privately yeah they will yeah. well is that a fun story yeah it was enjoyed it 
you can see why it's uh, one of the most popular stories in all of Korean uh, culture. The other three we talked about, Hongbu, Shimcheong, and um, uh, Chunhyang, were all pansori. That is to say, they were sung. Uh, this one is not. This one has never been part of a pansori. But uh, there's something about the way that it's written that it smells like an oral tradition to me uh, because it's episodic. And you can see in the old days, instead of turning on the TV, because you don't have a TV, you sit around and, hey, grandpa, tell us the story about Hong Gildong. And he tells you this episode, now go to bed. And then the next night, hey, grandpa, tell me about Hong Gildong. Tells you the upper, other episode. And there are various versions of the story because an oral tradition, it's told this way, it's told that way. And the core story is there, but there are all sorts of variations on the story. So it's a great part of Korean tradition. And thank you, Mija and Lauren for exploring this with me today. And we'll uh, say goodbye and hope to see you again next time. <laughs> see ya. Thank you. Thanks.